welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. I'm an adventurer. I'm a podcaster. I also do an occasional bit of motivational speaking as well. But if you want to find out more about me and Tough Girl podcast, then please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash tough girl podcast there's currently around 215 patrons who are supporting my mission to help increase the amount of female role models in the media get involved help me to continue sharing these incredible stories of women who are doing these awesome challenges and having these incredible adventures today i'm delighted we're going to be speaking to sarah davis who is the first woman to paddle 6,853 kilometers from the nile source in rwanda to the mediterranean sea sarah's expedition in involves a mix of paddling and kayaking through powerful rapids and waters filled with hippos and crocodiles. What a challenge, what an expedition, what a journey you must have been on. How are you feeling at the moment? Oh, good. You know, obviously I was like, happy to get to the to the end. You know, it was such a long journey, even before paddles hit the water. You know, you can imagine organizing something like this and then getting to the end. There's, that, there's sort of that mixture of happiness and relief and tiredness. And then there's also that little tinge of sadness as well that it's kind of, it's over. It's kind of over. But I tell you what we're going to be doing during this podcast is we're going to be reliving it. We're going to be finding out more about why you want to do this challenge, the planning, the preparation, how it came about and what the journey was actually like. So take us, well, actually, first of all, tell us a little bit more about who you are, where you grew up, where, you know, what was life like for you? So I grew up in the UK, like born um, down and grew up down in Sussex. Uh, sport was always like a big part of my life. Mum was awesome. She got me trying so many different sports as a kid. And that really kind of set me, set me up, I think. Um, and yeah, I was like, you know, at school here and university in London, lived in London for quite a long time. And then 15 years ago, I got a job. I was moved internally within National Australia Bank, who I was working for out to their Melbourne branch, um, and, or to head office rather. And so moved, moved to Australia, you know, it was initially going to be a two year contract and 15 years later, I'm still there. So yeah, that was sort of kind of the background. And it was a real pivotal point of, of moving to moving to Oz. And that's what really probably put me on the path to this expedition because it's there that I got into kayaking through the surf club. When I moved up to Sydney, I joined the surf club and started getting involved in the sports and got into surf ski paddling. Um, so that was kind of the start, you could say, of this journey. I mean, had you ever done anything like this before? No, look, you know, I've always done the adventurous type holidays and, you know, ridden horses across the desert in Namibia and trekked to Annapurna base camp. And, you know, I'm, I'm not really a, a sit by the pool for two weeks and, and sip cocktails kind of person. Uh, but anything like this, no, this was a whole new realm. So how did this idea come about? Because, yeah, it's, it's incredible traveling from the source to the sea, from the, from the Nile source through what is it 6,800 odd kilometers yeah so so yeah where did this idea come from or why did you decide that you needed to do something like this in your life um at that time I I got to a point I've tried I'd been in banking for years and then I'd had four years out as a personal trainer you know I just wanted a break from the from the corporate life and try something different and then I'd gone back into banking and I was actually I was I was working at Macquarie Bank and I loved it there it was like the best job I'd ever had you know best company I'd worked for loved it there but you know there was just still something missing and I guess I've always kind of been searching for this life less ordinary and and I wanted more fulfillment and to go and just do something completely different and I knew sort of I wasn't I couldn't see myself getting that fulfillment from work so that's when I just started doing a whole lot of soul searching. And it was when I saw, read or saw some documentaries about a couple of people who'd done some firsts. You know, one had um, paddled aboard, uh, a lie down paddle board from Coolangatta to Bondi, and someone else, a woman, had done an expedition kayaking on the down the Amazon. 
And, you know, those, those were sports that weren't the sports that these people had grown up with. And they were kind of like ordinary people, big dreams. And it just, it was that realization of, oh, maybe I could go and do something like that. And, and that was kind of the start. And I was like, okay, well, let's go and see if, you know, what hasn't been done. And I knew I wanted it to be kayaking because that was my, you know, my sport and I love it. And I started Googling and, you know, I was like, okay, someone's been around Australia and then looking what the rivers were and who's done what and saw that, you know, no woman had done a, a total descent of the Nile. So I was like, I just got goosebumps when I saw that. And, and I love Africa. It's kind of always been my, my preferred kind of continent to go to. So yeah, that's where it, that's kind of where it all came from. Oh, I love that. Especially I think the, the soul searching and trying to figure out the, the purpose or what it is that you wanted to do. And did, could you maybe try and go into that in a little bit more detail? So for example, for me, I know that I, you know, journaling, I found that really, really powerful, just writing things down and really trying to reflect back and answer different questions and having alone time and going into nature. How did you, I don't know, how did you, how did you do your soul searching? What worked for you? I actually read a book by Danielle Laporte. I don't know if you've heard this one, The Desire Map. No, and but that sounds great. It is, it's her approach is slightly different. Instead of sort of do the, what's your passion and just go follow that, which is probably kind of where I've ended up. But she looks at what do you, how do you need to feel in different aspects of your life, work, personal life, et cetera, et cetera. And then what makes you feel like that? And you come away from it a bit like you, you know, you, you work out what your values are. You come away with what your your needs are from how you want to feel. And things for me that came out were, you know, adventure, challenge, freedom, connection, and a few others. And and that sort of really helped me kind of shape where I wanted to go. Um, so yeah, that that was a really good process for me. Mm, I love what you said then I was like oh I agree 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 I was like that's definitely like ticking my boxes so tell us a little a little bit more about about the challenge and you know the distances what was involved and the countries and you know the overall sort of trip what the expectation was for the trip so like, as, as you said like the river is 6,850 something kilometers long it's there's a bit of debate about where it starts you know originally they said it's Uganda on the edge of Lake Victoria but they've since there have been various um, expeditions that have gone to find the source and there are t- two that have ba- debated one in Burundi one in Rwanda but the one that's you know most people are, uh, lean towards now is is Rwanda in the Nyborongo forest so that's what what I picked, and then you know logistically the, the, it goes Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, South Sudan, Sudan, Egypt, and that's following the White Nile. You've got the Blue Nile, which goes Ethiopia, Sudan, and the two rivers meet it in Khartoum, and then form the one river going up to to and through Egypt. Um, you know, you've got a, quite a lot of white water at the start and then through Uganda. So for me, not being a white water kayaker, I, I had done a recce to Uganda and done a little bit, but there was no way I was going to take this on. So it was going to be rafting from the, from where we could put in um, closest to the source as possible through to ideally it was going to be into like the first set of this one set of rapids in South Sudan and then swapping to kayaking. Um, but ended up having to skip South Sudan because it was just going to be too dangerous. They had the peace process had been agreed, but it was a long way from being sort of filtered down and it was just deemed to be too, too dangerous. So I kind of had to unfortunately skip that, but I do hope one day to go back and do that. But then, um, just kayaked from Sudan and Egypt on. Oh, fantastic. So how, having, so when you had this spark of an idea and you started Googling and you got the, you know, those, those goosebumps and you you could feel the excitement bubbling up thinking, oh my God, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become the first woman to, to kayak the length of, um, the length of the Nile, paddling the Nile. How long did you give yourself for the planning, the preparation, the logistics, sorting it, sorting it all out? When did you decide, you know, that's going to be my official start date? Well, I completely overestimated my capabilities, right? I was like, I can do this in six months. And in between that, I was going to do – I had a big race to do in, in Hawaii and then world championships in the ocean ski racing um, in Hong Kong. And it's like, yeah, I can totally work full-time, train for this and, and organize an expedition. 
uh, it ended up being just a tiny bit longer than that. So instead of it being, I think I was, I thought I'd be able to turn it around in six months. Um, it was more like two years to to get it all in place. Uh, it was just so much to it and all being new like I've never done any of this you know I had a lot of incredible people advising me and, and reached out to a lot of people and got a lot of you know suggestions to know what was involved but um yeah it took it took a little bit longer than than I'd originally thought but th- the whole process you know just through that that two years it was it was a, a great journey just as I say before paddles even hit the water yeah Do you know I think that's actually really interesting because I mean, I definitely suffer with this problem that when I decide I want to go and do something, I'm like, right, I want to go and do it like straight away. But obviously, sometimes you've got you do have to put in the planning, the preparation, Mm. figure out the logistics, you know, how are you going to make it work? And I think this is the point that many people almost give up or get overwhelmed by by these bigger types of challenge Mm. that, that you end up taking on. So I'd love it if you could just maybe reflect back on that two-year journey and you know what worked for you like how did you figure it out uh was it spreadsheets was it to do I mean it was probably like a whole variety of different things that you're needing to do but how did you get it done did you need to build a team around you or was it just sort of you driving everything it was just me I mean the big key part was getting in touch with a chap called Pete Meredith who has done um, a number of expeditions and then I managed and um, run a number and led expeditions. He was um, part of the team and who did a, a full descent of the Nile. And, and I reached out to him and he was the one able to go, you know, this is the kind of approvals. This is how long the whole trip's going to take. And just give me the, the sort of like the broad outline of a kind of a plan of what I need to get in place. And, and then I, I just started doing some research. You know, my background is um, risk management and project management. So I kind of got to use all my project management skills and most of it was spreadsheets. I did try some of the online tools you can get for project management, but I just found my spreadsheets easier and just had, you know, sections of right approvals from, you know, governments and authorities to personal preparation that's required to what's all the, I mean, finding out all the equipment that's needed uh, so it was just, you know, lots and lots of spreadsheets. And then, you know, I, I, I sort of branded it. I got my logo done. I built the website, got a video done, started to build the social media. Like there's, there's all these sort of different streams to it and basically just, yeah, endless, endless to-do lists and yeah, all the, the training and the prep. Um, actually the paddling was probably what I did the least of in preparation for the trip. Yeah. Financially, how are you paying for this? Look, it was mostly um, mostly self funded. I I did get some sponsors on board who were fantastic, like Shore and Partners Financial Services, my primary sponsor, and then also had quite a few equipment sponsors. So people like um, Big Water Rescue Equipment gave me all the white water equipment, and Kathmandu gave me camping gear. Um, Nile River Explorers, they were the one who gave me the rafting equipment to take to borrow for those those rafting sections. Um, I got my paddles from Brasher Sport and Bennett Paddles. You know, there was a lot of those like, by Kobe for the for the paddling gear. So I got quite a bit of gear donated. Um, Neris Kayaks gave me one of their their folding kayaks, but the the actual the money it was yeah self funded mostly. Do you know how much it cost you? Have you have you added it up yet? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't yet. So I'm and I'm really interested to do it. I think it'll scare me when I see how much how much it's it's costed. Um, how much it's cost rather. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing that and then I'll pull it all together. And I also like some people donated. Like I had the option for people to friends to donate, and some people, some of my friends were just so generous. So actually, you know, giving me cash. And I also I set up. So I've never been married and I was like oh okay well as I haven't done the whole wedding registry I'm going to set one up for my trip right so I set up basically an online gift registry in case anyone wanted to buy me some equipment for the um for the trip which which um, yeah quite a few people did oh I love that idea and can I just ask how old you are I'm 46. You're 46. I'm thinking, ooh, I'm thinking what, age, what age is an appropriate age to do that? <laughs> what would I be thinking? Oh, can I do that? Like, but I'm not, I've forgotten how old I am. Like 37? Am I 37 or 38? 37. I'm like, ooh, okay. Maybe I'll do that for my 40th if I'm not married. <laughs> do it. Do it. <laughs> oh, but you know, I love that. And that's a, that's a great thing to, to be able to get up and do. So you're doing your planning, you're doing your preparation, you're figuring out the logistics, you're using your risk management, you've got your spreadsheets. Um, what was the biggest sort of challenge with the planning? 
I think it's, the approvals is difficult um, because it's not, you can't, it's not like, I don't know, you know, applying for a visa to go on holiday where you find a website and it gives you step by step of what you need to do. It's so, you're trying to talk to people and, okay, Rwanda, I think that's going to be quite simple. And Uganda, okay, I don't need anything. But then I actually went on a recce to Sudan in Egypt because just so the advice I got, particularly from um, Pete Meredith, was that he said, look, those, those two countries are likely to be the most problematic. Um, and I just thought being doing it solo as a woman – that it might, that just might add to it. So I actually went out there and and went to visit the ministries of tourism um, and other departments and got a lot of support. I met like paddlers locally as well. Um, so that was probably the hardest part. And I actually hadn't got it all sorted but by the time I went. So, so quite a bit of it was kind of done, done on the fly. So talk to me a little bit more about the security and the safety aspect of taking on a challenge like this. I mean, obviously, you mentioned um, places like South Sudan and having to sort of skip yeah. sections. How did, and being also coming from the banking world um, and doing like <laughs> risk management as well, I think you'll maybe, you'll have like a really interesting perspective on how you manage risk or how, yeah, how you manage risk. Well, the principles are exactly the same. Um, it's just applying it into a sort of a, a very physical environment as opposed to an almost theoretical um, numbers environment in banking. You know, it was, you know, I had a huge risk management plan and initially you go through and identify, well, what are all the risks? Like, what's everything that could go wrong? And that was broken down into, we're going to write five categories. So you've got your illnesses and injuries, then um, any issues with uh, equipment that could go wrong, your key equipment, um, sort of people scenarios, whether that's approvals, hostile situations, theft, anything like that. Um, animals, any issues with animals uh, and the risks there. And then finally, like your environment, everything from your weather, the risks with weather, the rivers, the water, and so on and so forth. So going through, you identify everything, then assess it, you know, what's worst case, how likely is that, what's the consequence um, from then working out, well, are there any ways I can reduce it? So, you know, an example could be one of the risks is you get malaria. What's worst case? Well, it's not great. You know, you can, you can die from that. Well, what can you do to manage it? You can take the medication, you can avoid getting bitten. Um, and then you look at finally, you know, what, how are you going to react if you, what's your action plan if it does go wrong? So then with using the malaria example is to have the medication with you to, uh, to be able to treat um, treat the malaria. So I just went through and had this huge spreadsheet um, identifying and working out the action plans for all the like the key risks of which there were quite a few. <laughs> you, I think you know, that is really fascinating. I love how you've broken that down into five categories. Although I was thinking for malaria, I hope you had like a nice gin and tonic on that list as well. <laughs> I think it's the, is it the kid? The quinine. Qu That's quinine. what they used to say. The quinine in the tonic was supposed to was supposed to help prevent the malaria, but I, I don't know if that was just an excuse to be able to drink lots of tonic in the in the tropics, <laughs> <laughs> tonic gin and tonics. <laughs> Were you able to get insurance for your trip? I did, and that was quite challenging because as a resident in in Australia, it's actually quite tough to get. Like I found places. So, if as a resident in the UK, there are more companies offering the insurance, but as a resident in Oz, it was actually quite tricky, and I ended up getting a few different insurances. So Amex were the ones I went with sort of for the general insurance and they covered, I think, everything other than South Sudan. And then I got international SOS. So that's your kind of medical evacuation um, insurance. So that did cover me for, for everything. No, I think they couldn't cover me for Sudan, but because I had the travel insurance, it was a bit of a a mix match of of insurance um but for something like that you need the extra i think of, of say like an international sos to really be able to get those evacuations because if something does go wrong you're going to be very remote and it can be very difficult for, for to, to be got out of yeah 100 percent. so you're doing the planning you're doing the logistics you're breaking everything down i love how you're breaking everything down um did the project ever get 
overwhelming and then how did you deal were you were you stressed in the run-up or I don't know if stress is the right word maybe not stress but were you oh no 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 that's the right word, that was the right word. <laughs> <laughs> totally I was so stressed running up to it everyone kept you know for a for a long time because I didn't have a day everyone would keep asking me because everyone's really interested it's like have you got a day have you got a day I was like no and then I finally had a day and then everyone's like are you excited are you excited and I kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. And But inside I was going, no, I'm terrified. You know, I was, it was still so much, uh, you know, sort of self-doubt and worry and fear. And it was, it was a total kind of leap of faith actually getting on that plane because I still had things so much to sort out. You know, I didn't have my rafting team. I had someone who was potentially interested, but I didn't have the team and I didn't have all the permits. And yeah, so it was it was very stressful. And then, of course, you know, wrapping everything up to go away for seven, eight months. Um, there was a hell of a lot to do to do there. So it was it was very stressful. Did you leave your job? Did you take unpaid leave? Or did you take a sabbatical? What, what did you do? I quit. I Woo! quit. So Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't hear that. No, by the way, that's not me encouraging other people to go and quit <laughs> your jobs. <laughs> It was, you know, it was one of those scary moments, but it was like, it was also really liberating. And it was, in some ways it was, again, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the right thing for everyone, but to have that safety net taken away, I just felt was going to be a good thing that if I got to a point of going, oh, this is too hard, oh, I'm scared and just be, oh, I can just easily go back to my job. You know, if you haven't got a job to go back to, it's like, well, I might as well just carry on. That was sort of my part of my thinking behind it. Um, So yeah, so at the moment I'm kind of, homeless and jobless <laughs> <laughs> we'll, go, we'll definitely come on to that in a little bit um, so mental preparation so you, you said that you were feeling you know this you were feeling stressed there was self-doubt there was this worry there was these feelings of fear mentally how were you preparing yourself for this trip what were you doing to get yourself in the right headspace look a lot of it the risk going through that risk management plan was really good because then you know or you've got a pretty good idea of everything that go could go wrong. So you kind of got your worst case and you're building up from that. But I did a lot of, I watched TED Talks, you know, looking at courage and overcoming fear and and how you can stop yourself going into panic mode when, you know, when the proverbial hits really hits the fan. Um and there was everything, it was one book, and Ted talked 10 seconds of courage. Oh, sorry, I've forgotten the woman's name. Um, Mel, Mel Robinson? No, no, it's not. It was a... Um, Brenny Brown. Brenny, Brenny. No, 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 no. 10 seconds of courage. It's a woman who used to be a, I think it was karate, certainly martial arts specialist, oh, and, I, and I, then I, got really sick. Um I've listened anyway. to a podcast episode with her. I know yeah. who you're talking about, so apologies that we can't remember <laughs> who it is. And, you know, and then there was another one that, you you know, little things stick with you. It was a TED Talk and someone who was ex-military and he said what helps and what makes a big difference in a situation where it's a very, you know, it's a bad, scary situation is to look at it as threat or challenge. Because, of course, if you look at it as a threat, then you're on the negative and you're on the sort of defensive. You look at it as challenge. It's like, oh, game on, right, let's do it. It totally flips your your mental approach to it and that was something that I did find really useful you know when we were approaching some big scary rapids and it's like I just looked at it as a total threat it's like no Sarah flip it challenge and that that really did help me not always but a lot of the time yeah I, I find that interesting as well. It's like when people, before they're going up to do public speaking and um, people always say to me, oh, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. And I'm always like, no, you're, you're excited. You're excited because mm. it's, the same, it's the same feelings. You've just got, sometimes you've got to almost like trick yourself and use whatever you can to do this. So um, yeah, and sometimes it's just building up what you've got in your, your toolbox. These different tips and tricks and little things will stick with you. Um, but especially when you're filling your brain with, you know, listening to watching these amazing TED Talks and listening to podcasts and, you know, just figuring all of this stuff out. Um, training. Did you get much chance to train? Because sometimes I think the expedition planning can end up taking over. And especially, like you said, you, you, you're still working full time. You, you're planning all of this. You had other events that you were doing. How what I mean, I you're you're pretty fit anyway, I'd say. Mm. Um did you manage to do any sort of specific training for it? I did, but it wasn't the paddling. Like I 
having done so much paddling and some long distance events, I, I had a strong base there and good fitness. And what I'd found like the year before, six months before, I'd I'd been training, as I say, for a couple of long events and my body gone into burning muscle storing fat. So I knew that was going to happen on this, most likely to happen on this trip. So I really kind of cut back the paddling, also knowing that the beginning was going to be rafting. And and I knew that you, you build up your fitness for something like the, the long distance paddling for a trip like this. If I'd done too much beforehand, I'd have also risked injury, overuse injury. So I actually put a big focus from the physical training on trying to put some muscle back on. So I was spending a lot of time in the gym lifting heavy trying to bulk up as much as I could muscle wise so that there was something there one to protect against injuries and overuse injuries and two that there was sort of some muscle there to catabolize if if that's the way my body went which I feel it, it, it most definitely did um, the other training was then more skill side of things so and this is another thing that ended up it took time because you've got to find the courses to go on so there was remote first aid which was a great course. I did um, wilderness, four days of wilderness survival. I did the swift water rescue technician course, which was incredibly valuable to do. Um, it kind of made me more scared because you learn like what all the risks are. And I was like, I knew white water was scary, but now it's like, now it's really, really scary. Mm. Um, but at least understanding, you know, what to do. And, you know, I was going to, I knew I was going to be with really good rafting people. So it would be, if something happened, I would kind of not be completely useless if there was a, a situation to manage. And then the other thing I did was host, um, uh, Krav Maga self-defense training. So that's a form of self-defense training developed by the Israeli defense forces. Um, so that includes everything sort of from, um, physical attacks to actually being attacked with weapons. So I spent, so once a week going for, I don't know, it was probably nearly a year. Um, it was actually really good fun training. I enjoyed that. Um, oh, so that doing is that so awesome. Oh, yeah. sorry, I, lo- I love watching those videos. It's really like you just go straight straight in and like break an arm. It's like no mess- <laughs> <laughs> it's like no messing about. <laughs> yeah, you really do learn how to inflict some damage. And there was part of me, not that I would ever want to be attacked, but there was part of me going, I just want to see how I'd react. And I did say to my flatmate, it's like, oh, can we just like try some scenarios, like just jump out and attack me? And he's like, no way, <laughs> you'll kill me. <laughs> this is reminding me of like Ross and Friends when he was trying to do his karate or something. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I love everything that you're doing though, because, you know, you you are getting, you're just increasing the level of your skills. You're going into each area in more detail um, and just really putting in the work actually to make sure that mm. you are prepared as possible to take on this, to take on this huge, amazing challenge. Yeah. So, And it also helps not just with the physical preparation, but the your confidence as mm. well of like you've covered all this stuff, you know, you know, yeah, for me it was, it, it helped mentally as, as, as well. Yeah. So take us back to, to the start in Rwanda. Take us back to maybe yeah. just getting on the plane in Australia and just being like, oh, my God, this this is it. Like, Because when did you set off? So that was – I, I left Sydney on the 26th of September last year. Um, like I said, it was just so much – it just felt like a huge leap of faith because there was stuff to sort out. So I got to – I flew into Uganda because that's where – um, I was going to get the rafting gear from and try to build the team. So there's, it's um, at that point, it's in Ginger, which is just kind of at the start of where, of Lake Victoria, where it becomes the, the river again. And there's a lot of white water. It's amazing for white water kayaking and rafting. So my plan was to go there and, and pull the team together there as well as pick up the equipment. So I met Paolo, who, um, John Dahl, who owns Nile River Explorers, who had been helping me, he said, look, Paolo's interested in doing it. And the the great thing is he was one of the few people who've done the river from Rwanda to back to Uganda, and very few people have. And then he got a couple of the other rafting guides, Cora and Peter, um, to join. So spent a bit of time like building that team. A lot of conversations happening with um, people like the Rwandan Development Board to try and get the approvals. So it took it's probably three weeks of getting it all together and then three and a half weeks. And then we, you know, loaded up all the gear, trying to get all the food, like just doing a food plan, right? It's like you've got to get three to four weeks worth of food and working out, you know, again, it's like back to the old spreadsheets and going, okay, well, how many calories do we need? And like, well, what can we take? Cause you want stuff that's not going to go off. 
um, isn't too heavy and is kind of like nutritionally dense and calorie dense. So there were lots of pasta and rice and things like that. But just working it out, how much do we need? So I ended up like three big barrels filled with food and then all the electrical equipment. And so we got everything and got over to Rwanda. And that was a drama in itself. We had so many car problems on the way over, like the first car broke down and then one of the drivers got arrested overnight and then another one had two flat tires. And that was, you know, it's like, oh, is this, is this a message that I really shouldn't be doing this? But I'm like, nah, I'm too far in now. I'm not stopping. Um, so we eventually, you know, got the approvals in Rwanda. They were great. And and initially, like the first, I went to the actual source, which is, as I say, in the night, deep in the Nyabrongo forest. So we had a couple of guys take us into that. And, and you know, I'd seen pictures of the sign, but to actually kind of like walk around the corner and, and see the sign while the actual source itself is basically like this muddy little pool, really. It's not that significant, but the significance to me was – was huge and it was just amazing to to be there and know right this is it's really kind of this is it it's happening and then it was the next day that we actually got to to start the expedition and and you know blow the raft up for the first time and tie everything on and and launch it and we had a huge audience like all these all the local people have come like watching what on earth are these people doing um and it took us a couple of hours to load up but then 27th of october we, we were actually on the river and it was just the most amazing feeling of like suddenly all that stress and, and worry just, just lifted. And it was kind of like, even if it's just one day on the river, it's kind of, it's enough just to have got to this point. Oh God, incredible. I love it. I love it. So <laughs> you're, you're out on the river, you're, you're paddling for the first time with all the equipment, you're, you, you're at the start of this phenomenal journey. What was what were the days like? Like how did you how did the days pass by? Were they were they intense? Were they relaxing? Were they stressful? Were they calming? Or was it just a complete and utter mixture? You know, dealing with I suppose almost this constant unknown. Like every time you mm. went round a bend or went over some rapids, so something new that you were coming up against. Yeah, you got it spot on there. It really was. It was just it, it, minute to minute was kind of into the unknown, and we you know there was a a certain element of routine of you know get up. Um, we, we just pack up really quickly, well, relatively quickly load up tight thing. We wouldn't unload everything from the raft at night, but load most, um, like some things off. So we get everything back on the raft, get going. And then, you know, something like around 10 o'clock, I would actually make breakfast on the go, like mix up some oats. Oats were just brilliant for, it's for like a, it's a good fuel to start us for the day and Nutella and peanut butter and, um, some protein powder even in there. And then, you know, we just keep going all day till generally about four or five where we'd start looking for a camping spot for the night and, you know, pull up, set up camp, make dinner, and then go to sleep, repeat the next day. So that was kind of the general routine. But, you know, what happened in between that, there was, uh, yeah, every day was different. So this is, this is going to be the difficult question, but can you just share some – some of the stories, some of some of the highlights, some of the moments which which stand out for you. And I know uh, for a trip this length, there's going to be hundreds, if not <laughs> if not thousands, of these tiny moments. But but maybe ones now that you've had a little bit of a chance to reflect back on, which are still which are still with you, which really sort of um, got into your heart. Look, there's a lot, and it was very like the the trip kind of came out into the first section from Rwanda to sort of partway through Uganda was real adventure. And I'll come back to some of those stories. And then it was a bit more, a lot more sort of cultural, less, a lot less drama and, and, and adventure and just really getting into the cultural side. And then as I moved up to Sudan, it was a mix of that culture and then the physical challenge of kayaking for long, long hours. And then that sort of continued with that physical challenge through Egypt. And so, you know, what I got, you know, the, the memories from all of that are really varied. But, um, you know, a couple of things that happened, like we had, we had so much drama at the start. So, we, we, you know, we were attacked by a hippo one day, like full on attacked. We then got um, kind of tricked across the Burundian border and, and uh, arrested and detained and held under house arrest for three days there. We then ran some rapids that we had to run these rapids. We don't even know how we survived it. So there was there was so much in those first few weeks. It was insane. 
I know. I was gonna say I know I shouldn't laugh, but when you talk about <laughs> hippos, I always think of like the hungry, hungry hippos. You know, the, <laughs> the, those yes. you know, the old toy with the things like slamming down because they are big, scary animals. Hippos. They're not. They're not cuddly. Oh my goodness, they are. They they've ended up topping out my my least favorite animal. I have to say, we you know we got to hippo territory a little bit sooner than I was expecting. So we were on the outskirts. The Nibronga goes on the outskirts of Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, and woke up that morning and could hear a hippo making its way upstream. And I was like, oh damn, we're here already. And that day, you know, we had an initial went past a, a couple of. Um, groups of, of hippos that was fine and then we were coming around this corner and it's relatively narrow the river there so it's only probably about 70 80 meters wide and very like really bendy so you they tend to hang out like around the corner where there isn't as much um current but we we came around and then this this baby hippo popped up on the left and we were like, where's mum before we could even say the word <laughs> she popped up on the right and we'd gone between her and baby. Oh. <laughs> she lost it, right? So she starts coming for us. And we you've got the way the setup on the raft is you've got one person kind of like standing or sitting on a big set of oars and then two people at the front with just paddles paddling. So I was there up front with one of the other guys and, and someone on the oars. And we just like, it was like forward. So we were frantically trying to get to the, the bank and she came at us and she put her head, I didn't actually see this, I was looking forward, but she put her head underneath and tried to flip the raft. But because we had like so much gear on that, one, there were four of us, plus all the gear, plus the frame and the oars, et cetera, et cetera, it was, it was too heavy for her. So she stopped, kind of thought about it, and I thought we were okay. But then she came at us again, and I just felt this almighty tug and looked around, and there was this hippo basically attached to the back of the raft. She'd sunk her teeth into the back of it. Um Luckily at that point, she let go. I don't know whether it was probably, you know, the air coming out or then she decided, you know, realised that she was getting a bit further away from her baby. So she backed off enough time for us to actually get off the raft onto the riverbank. Um, she went away and then we were able to unload, pull the raft out, and then the boys spent the next couple of hours patching it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, do you know what? That's not a bad result for a run-in with a mummy hippo, mummy hippo. <laughs> <laughs> it was but it was just you know at the time I think when you're facing like in that absolute you know death defying moment or you know potentially deadly situation rather there isn't that fear it's just your all reaction and there wasn't fear it was just right we've just got to act and try and get get out of this as quickly as possible but what was really terrifying was then the thought of getting back on the river knowing this was you know, day one in hippo territory and we had a long way to go and I was so scared getting back on the river but one of the guys Peter sort of changed the approach he said look if we come across or more like when we come across more hippos we will actually get off the river like we will get off the raft and tow the raft around rather than because you just haven't got time to react and get away from them and it had literally been probably less than an hour before we had to put that into practice and we came across this big male hippo and he put on, well, I'm no hippo body language expert, but it looked like a fairly psychotic, aggressive display. It's like opening and closing of the jaws and huffing and puffing and um, jumping up and down and throwing his backside in the air and scattering excrement. And it was a terrifying, even from the, you know, off the water, it was terrifying. Um and yeah, like you say, they're just, they are so big and so irration, seemingly irrationally aggressive. They, yeah, the sound of those things still makes my blood run cold. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things that I love when, um, when I'm sort of out, out traveling, whether it's on the Appalachian Trail or cycling down Pacific Coast Highway, it, it's the people that you get to, to meet, these sort of special moments. Um, what what did people think of you in Africa? You know, th this blonde woman paddling along, <laughs> paddling the length of the Nile. Um, yeah, like what 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 people must have. Well, actually, I'm putting words in your mouth. Yeah, what, what did people think when they sort of met you or find out what you were doing? Yeah, I mean, I felt like a little bit like a traveling freak show because people are looking at you and that kind of like, what are you doing? Um, everyone was just really interested all the way through all the countries. I, like, you know, what is it you're doing and, and why are you doing it and you know, nothing but 
friendliness and you know people being really welcoming um, particularly like Sudan the hospitality of the people there is just next level and I'd heard it from anyone who'd been to Sudan everyone says the same thing like they will you know I could have been hosted in and put up with bed and food every night in that in that country and we did get hosted one night and you know just total stranger sees us um paddling this is kayaking and invited you know it wasn't just me it was a guy who was with me and then we had a at the time we actually had a support crew on on the on the road and you know we were all invited to stay given beds you know invited into the homes got to meet the family and we were fed and it was just this incredible hospitality and you know yeah the interest in in what I was doing um yeah I was I was blown away by it were you ready to finish the trip like how were you feeling towards the end um because I'm, it's difficult on long expeditions because obviously there's there's a goal, you know, the, the finish line, finishing it, completing what you set out to start, what that you started to do. But also I think it's the the impact on your body and your mind of this constant sort of background pressure of, of achieving. And, and so how were you coping like physically and mentally towards the end? Look, physically, I was amazed at how... Um, my body held up, particularly my shoulders, because I'd had a bit of a shoulder injury going into it. And I just, I went into denial of like, no, my shoulders are going to be fine. And actually they were, I mean, they did go through a big adjustment. Like the first 10 days of long days kayaking um, were just painful. Um, But I know, you know, and this is another part of the research I'd done is looking at people who've done, you know, put their body through extreme situations like this and and it, it's amazing how it adapts so that was fine I'd actually got lower the only problem I was getting with and still got is lower back strain because the kayak I was um the kayaks I was paddling was were different to to mine and we were battling headwinds a lot and I couldn't get the leg drive so I was then using just having putting a lot of more pressure on my back so that got a bit sore but nothing too bad um it meant mentally I was ready to finish and it's just that, like you say, there's that constant pressure and the constant problem solving, you know, every day. And I love problem solving, but, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a limit and I reach my limit um, and organizing, constantly organizing logistics and people and, and things and planning. And it was just like I was you know, mentally ready to finish. And, you know, when you start to see the end or the end is in, you know, it's in sight, starting to get a bit you know, you start thinking more about home and getting a little bit homesick and just really looking forward to to sort of getting to the to the end um, while still trying to make sure, you know, no, enjoy every moment because you're going to miss this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, reflecting back now, so you finished, you finished in um, April, so uh, quite recently. Um, what do you, what do you think you learned most from, from going through not only paddling the full length of the Nile and being the first woman to do it but also you know doing the planning and the preparation and putting yourself out there and completing this incredible challenge you know the joy of actually just taking things a little bit slower um you know I think we all run around a million miles an hour and just that taking the time to be present and enjoy the journey um that was definitely one of them um you know, making sure when you do things like this is is having a strong why behind it. You know, the why for me was was looking for that fulfillment and sense of achievement and the challenge and the adventure. The how at the start was to be the first woman to do the full descent. As it turned out, you know, I had to skip some section. I couldn't do South Sudan, which I was really disappointed about. But then I had to keep coming back to, well, am I still reaching my why? And and that sort of helped me sort of deal with that. Okay, I've had to, you know, miss a section or I've done had to do some like different forms of transport. And no, I'm still I'm okay with that. And and I'm I'm still getting out of this what what I really wanted to do. Um and like I said, you know, it was still a hell of a lot of paddling, you know, the three thousand kilometers of paddling and over a thousand on on the raft and and some of the things that happened because I didn't paddle, you know, were real adventures as well so it kind of added to it as as much as you know if anything taking away so you know there was that it was learning um you know control the controllables and just trust that the process is going to happen you know there was I'm so used to my project management of having everything lined up you know you can imagine in financial services Mm. and you're, you're going live with a project everything has to be signed off and in place and ready to go and I had to really adjust to not having everything 
in place and ready to go. And it just trusting that it will all fall into place as you go, which, you know, everyone's saying to me, that is kind of like the African way of, of doing it. And I did mutter many, many times, this is Africa, um, TIA. Uh, and yeah, just having that trust and just letting go of some of the control. And, and it's a bit like, you know, instead of getting someone to build the bridge and then you cross it, you're kind of building the bridge and crossing it as you go. And, and that's really what this whole expedition was like. And that was, you know, quite a change for me. And, and now I've sort of got more used to it. So I think if I, if I go back to project management, the old school, I'd be like, oh, it'll all just work itself. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'll get sacked quite quickly. <laughs> no, I think in banks, they, they like the T's crossed and the dot I's dotted and uh, the boxes ticked as they are as such. Well, yeah, you know, honestly, massive congratulations. It's a huge achievement, um, what you've done, and, you know, incredible role model for other women out there as well. And I'd love you to share a little bit more about winning women. Like, is that is that your is that your idea? Is that your initiative? What's t- tell us a little bit more about that? Look, it was something that and it's something I want to try and um, sort of build on now, maybe post the trip. It was me, it was all about trying to promote other women and what they're doing and and you know the from friends to people I come across, you know, to like the people on, on you know, amazing women on, on your podcast, um, just to sort of show what other people are doing. You know, as I say, I got inspired because I saw someone else who'd gone and done, um, you know, uh, followed a big dream and, and really put themselves out there and gone on a big adventure. And it was almost that try and pay it forward of like one, you know, showcase what other, talk about what other people are doing and hope that that might inspire more people. And, you know, it was certainly something I wanted to do with this trip was hope that it might, um, you know, spark the imagination in a way that mine have been sparked and, you know, encourage women and girls to, you know, to have some big dreams and go on big adventures and, you know, and be okay with not having all the answers and not knowing how you're going to do it and, and you know, just going and learning and finding out as you go and, and just, you know, back yourself and, and, and go for it. Yeah, everything you said, 100,000%. <laughs> do you think you're going to write a book about your expedition? Definitely. Yeah. I'm, and I'm really looking forward to it. So many people have said like, are you writing a book? Are you writing a book? And there was, cause it was so much, you know, I put stuff in my blogs, but there was you know, so much happening behind the scenes as well. I sort of couldn't all share at the time. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to, I kept a lot, you know, diaries, I write my diary every single day. And, and I think it will be a really nice process, you know, even if the book never gets published to actually just go back and, relive it and probably get a lot more out of it because you know what it's like when you're so in it at the time you, you haven't got that perspective and and then rereading it and sort of reliving those thoughts and feelings and experiences I think I'm hoping you know I'll, I'll, it'll, it'll it'll draw more out of it for me yeah absolutely and you can always self-publish as well don't let anybody stop you from publishing a book <laughs> you can definitely get it out That's definitely true. get it out there so you said, at you said at the beginning of the podcast so you're currently homeless and jobless what, <laughs> what, what have you got a plan or are you just are you okay for a while or, or what's going to be happening look I'm I'm meeting with a with lots of different people and and just going to see see what happens um you know the some people said oh you know you should go and do some speaking which would be great Uh, like I said, the book. And, you know, I'd love to find a way to use, potentially use my risk management skills, but outside of a financial services um, sector. Um, I probably shouldn't say that in case I do go for any jobs in banking. (laughs) Um, But no, ideally, you know, finding something that just, as I say, uses my skills, because, you know, I've I've been doing it for a long time, but kind of in a a field that's a bit more akin to, to what I love and what I do. So, you know, I'm going to see. I'm going to see what I can find. I'm also interested in getting far more involved in the not-for-profit area as well. Um, so, you know, if I can find something that brings together those things, that would be great. And, you know, I want to go and spend some more time in Africa. So I'm actually thinking of, if I can, sort of going back to Uganda relatively soon to to write the book. Um, you know, I love it there. I made a lot of friends there. I was in Ginger for quite a long time. So I think while it's still relatively fresh, go and do that there. But I I do need to get some income coming in from somewhere. So we'll we'll see how things pan out. Can you see yourself doing like another expedition like this again in the future? Ah, totally. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Probably. I don't think I want to do something as big as this. And, I, you know, big in the sense of the time it took to complete um, I mean, I wasn't, I was, it was six months going, it wasn't on the river for six months, you know, there were stops to organise it, but 
I don't think I'd be ready to do something as long as this just yet or something as complex logistically to do with different craft, different teams, different, you know, countries to go through where you've got to get all those approvals and that kind of complexity. Um, but I'm definitely, I really want to, you know, I've had obviously quite a lot of time to do some thinking. So there's a few sort of thoughts floating around as to what what could be next um so yeah definitely this is this is by no means the end i think we could say this is the start hopefully fingers crossed oh fantastic well please do keep us updated especially about the book and any future expeditions that you end up doing because i know they're going to be absolutely incredible but sarah i'd love for you to leave our listeners with just some final words of advice or just you know whether it's a mantra or a quote or just something that you've learned that could help spark something in another Mm. woman out there to really to do something outside of her comfort zone and to take on a big challenge and to really make sure that she's living life to the fullest for for me I think the the big thing is is just you know it's just do it and and you know you can look at a a dream or goal like you know if you can believe it you can you can do it and if you can dream it you can do it it's just to not be too overwhelmed by the size of it and just break it down into small achievable actions and don't keep focusing on the like the big scary kind of end goal or what you're working towards but just take take small steps small action all the time you know people say what's you know how would you eat an elephant and it's like well one bite at a time because it's you know just it's so big some of these things and it's just just do it you know we only regret really the things that we don't do and you know, when you go and do something that you're really passionate about and you're excited about, you know, what blew me away was how many people were there and willing to support me and give me advice and, you know, really go out of their way to help make my dream come true. So don't be put off by not having all the answers or knowing how you're going to do it. Just, just start, just, yeah, yeah, just start and do it. I love it. Although I think in your case, it wouldn't be, how do you eat an elephant? It would be, how do you eat a hippo? How do you eat a hippo? (laughs) hippo. Yes. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. So, Sarah, where would be the best place for people to follow along with your expedition to find out more information about you and winning women and, um, you know, keep updated with, with what's going to be happening next? Well, at the moment, it's still everything's on pedalthenile.com. So that's my website. And that's also the handle on Instagram and my Facebook page. Probably Instagram's where I'm, I'm a little bit more active, um, but also Twitter um, yeah, I will be launching a, a new website, which will sort of be the, well, we know what comes next, but that's, you know, it'll all get transitioned over. So yeah, that's probably the best spot to, to catch me at the moment. I'll be there for, for quite a while longer. Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about your journey and the expedition of Paddling the Nile. Absolutely incredible to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. A massive thank you to everybody who has been listening to the Tough Girl podcast. I really do appreciate it. We're coming up to 800,000 downloads, 800,000 listens. That's in 174 countries around the world. That is amazing. So I just want to say a massive thank you to you for listening, for choosing the Tough Girl podcast to help you get through your commute, your run, your cycle, pottering in the garden, pottering in the house, driving in the car, sitting on the tube, sitting on trains. I really do appreciate it. And I hope it inspires you and motivates you in your daily life and makes you think about what's the next big challenge or adventure that you're going to go on there's so much motivation inspiration there's so many incredible stories there's so much tips and advice really for you to pick and choose what's going to work well for you so if you are brand new please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com and on the website you can find all the details from our previous guests um it's going you know the podcast goes back to 2015 now over 200 episodes on the website is where you can find more information about me some of the different challenges that i've done from running the marathon to Saab, six marathons in six days, to through hiking the Appalachian Trail, to most recently cycling the Pacific Coast Highway and Baja, California. So a ton of stuff for you to go and check out couple of things I just want to mention. I'm super excited that I'm going to be heading to Run Fest Run with three patrons and supporters of the Tough Girl podcast. Patrons are the financial supporters of the podcast. They are backing me. They are backing the mission. They are helping me to produce and create this content and also 
helping me to be able to earn a living doing this and you know doing doing what I love and doing what I'm absolutely passionate about so signing up to be a patron is super easy you can sign up from two dollars a month which really would make a massive difference all the way up to 25 dollars and to be honest it's not about the amount of money that you're supporting it's just having people supporting because if I get you know a thousand patrons supporting at two dollars a month that then becomes a massive game changer so if you can afford to donate two dollars a month that would be incredible it really really does add up up. If you can afford to donate at $5 a month, that will be amazing. And if you donate at $5 a month, there are a couple of benefits that you get from that. You could get to join the Tough Girl Tribe, which is a closed Facebook community for the listeners and patrons um, of the podcast. It has been closed since January 2018, so it's only new paying patrons who are allowed to join. So there's about about 1,800 members in there at the moment, which is absolutely incredible. I also invite our guests, so previous guests are also um, invited to join. So there's a whole amazing collection of inspiring and incredible women in this in the in the in the closed Facebook group. So a couple of things that I do is or I try and do is at the end of every month I do a book draw. So this month we've got Ros Savage's a signed copy of Ros Savage's book, Stop Drifting, Start Rowing. Ros Savage has also been on the podcast as well. She's the first woman to row solo across all of the three oceans, the Atlantic, the Indian and the Pacific. Incredible woman, such an inspiration. Um, then occasionally I also do like offers. So things like Run Fest Run, which is this incredible running festival. These tickets are worth a hundred Hundred and forty pounds, and I got given um, four tickets. So me, you know, obviously I'm going to be going, which would be super cool. But then I was able to put it out to members of the tribe who are patrons at the five dollar level and say, "Look, are you free this weekend? Do you want to come with me? Come to this festival." Um, about eight people were free that weekend, so I put names in the hat, pulled it out, names done on a draw on a Facebook Live, and boom, we've got uh, a little mini Tough Girl Tribe meetup happening at Run Fast Run, which I'm really, really excited about. Just want to do a couple of shout outs, really. Um, just say a massive thank you to Meg Saunders, Rowena Harding, Rona Patterson um, for signing up to be patrons this month. I really, really do appreciate it. It makes such a big difference. So please do go check out Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash tough girl podcast and as i said every patron will get their name on a dedicated page at tough girl challenges but if you sign up you know i'd love you to sign up at the two dollars a month if you can sign up at five that would be absolutely incredible and then you can if you're a female then you can come and join the tough girl tribe we have a book club we have success sundays i share a lot more information in there i'm also very very active in there if you know if you want to ask me questions or if you've if you've got yeah if you've got questions or you need encouragement or support or you're struggling at the moment a couple of shout outs massive well done to charlene gibson who did the rat race dirty weekend full mucker yesterday 20 miles and get this 200 plus obstacles Charlene you absolutely smashed it I hope you are recovering well what an incredible achievement well done to Rosie Baxendine who did five brutal but amazing days bike packing the outer Caragorms loop I've seen the photos and wow that looks amazing Ruth Blanco now I know that you are currently getting or figuring out the clip in shoes on a road bike and you're still finding it a little bit awkward and scary but you are doing it and you did 20 miles the other day massive massive well done it's always challenging when you're trying something for the first time but keep persevering keep doing it and soon before you know it you won't even realize that you've got a clip in shoes well done to Vicky Royal who did her Balfron 10k um, which is a super challenging race, especially as it's so hilly. So massive well done for that. Good job for getting out there. So if you haven't signed up for a race or a challenge or you haven't taken that first step yet, you have to take the first step. No one else can do that for you. You have got to be the one who have got to live your life. You've got to take that first step. And um, there'll be people around you who will support you, who will encourage you. But you have got to be the one to take that first step. So do that today. Do that today, sign up for that race, take that action, book that holiday, do what you want to do, make it happen because it is your life and you only get one life. Sorry, I'm off on a, (laughs) I'm off, I'm I'm off, I'm not going to be able to stop myself from talking. But I do just want to say, obviously, a massive thank you to members of the Tough Girl Tribe. You're so incredibly supportive. Um, I I love being part of this community. Um, It really is fantastic. And a massive thank you to all of my patrons around the world. There's over 219 now, which is incredible. I really do appreciate every single one of you. Um, I wish I could say thank you more often. Um, I hope you do realize from the bottom of my my heart how much I appreciate you contributing and um, believing in me and supporting 
supporting me in the work that I do. It makes such a massive difference in allowing me to produce this content and to do this work. Have an awesome day wherever you are, whatever you are doing. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode. We've got some cracking episodes coming up. So please do make sure that you subscribe uh, so you don't miss out. All right, take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.